Arteta! What a strike! season game but don't worry everyone's handled it with the calm and equanimity no i'm kidding we're freaking out this is the arsenal vision post-match podcast my name is elliot smith the block man twitter yankee gunner look you know if if arsenal are going to play a preseason game like they're in mid-november form then we have to analyze that preseason game like we're in mid-november form probably not probably not going to do that but we may talk about it we will talk about it we'll talk about joe willick we'll talk about transfer rumors we'll talk about The fact that Mikel Arteta was quoted as saying, we have one transfer, he's very good, and we are going to be fine. So that's a thing that happened. Um, But first, I want to let you know, free registration window for the Vegas event is closing. So come to Vegas, please. There are now over 300 of you uh, registered and signed up for all the events to come. You don't have to stay at the win. I know those rooms might be gone by now. You can check the discount. Um, Was up and running last I checked, but I think, the message says there's like three rooms left, but you can stay wherever you want in Vegas and uh, just come. You'll get a wristband as long as you're registered. It looks like we're going to have a, a full buyout of a, a sort of sportsy bar kind of place on the Saturday night, which was a new thing that's getting added to the lineup. So I'm pretty excited about that, as well as uh, some charity stuff with Gooners versus Cancer, as well as the Stats Bomb Transfer Symposium, as well as the live Q&As, the live shows, the studio shows, uh, and on and on and on, and some some fun people will be there. And I hope you will, because I would love to raise a glass to you, toast to you and, and, and have a nice drink. Um, maybe we can even pour some bourbon in our, in our Saka riding a unicorn mug, wearing our Saka riding a unicorn t-shirt. I will let you know that we, um, we do have the, the web shop up and running now at avpodcast.com. So you can go there or you can go to our regular site and just hit shop and it'd take you there. Uh, everything ships all over the world and, and hopefully pretty speedy. What we've done is we've tried really hard to make it good stuff. So Brandon McKenna, uh, hired him to do all the designs. He's killing it. Um, the clothes are all like ring spun cotton that's reclaimed, recycled, organic, all that stuff. So the goal is to just have really nice stuff. So if no one wants it, fine. But if anybody wants it, at least the stuff we're sending out is really nice. And then on Mondays, what we're going to start doing is some limited edition drops related to some fun stuff. So we have one for Smith Row coming this Monday that'll be really fun. So look forward to that. Anyway, um, enough of that nonsense. Let's do... Uh, a podcast. And if you do want an instant reaction to the preseason friendly, we actually did one for Patreon, mostly as a laugh, but actually it was kind of fun. So you can listen to that if you want. But for here right now to discuss all the topics of Tim, you can find him on Twitter at Sobredo. Hello, Tim. Hello there. And Clive, you can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. I do want to say one last thing, which is just thank you so much to Phil Costa, who was brilliant on the Euro Daily Pods. And um, yeah, hiring, yeah. yeah, hiring Phil to do that was w- like one of the very few good decisions I've made in many, many years. So I think what we'll do for Patreon this fall, because there's been so much request to keep him on board, we'll have him on the regular pod, of course, but I think we're going to do a European League roundup once a week for patrons and uh, bring him on to tell us what's happening in the European League so that then when we talk about that stuff, I can pretend I know what I'm talking about. Maybe not the best season for it since we won't face anyone in Europe this season, but it'll get us prepared for what's to come down the road when we qualify for the Champions League uh, by winning the title this season. So, Tim, we'll start with you on Joe Willick. Let's do the Joe Willick mm. thing first because it has heated up again. The The latest rumor is Newcastle are skint. They have no money. They can't do anything. They can't buy anything. Everything stinks for Newcastle, which Newcastle fans can tell you has been pretty true for a while. But they do want Joe Willick. He is the apple of their eye. I've seen rumors of just a loan. I've seen rumors of loan with a compulsory option. I've seen rumors of a purchase. The price seems to be floating around at $20 million. What I want to ask you is, if there was a loan with no obligatory purchase thing, if it was just a loan and then a decision was made next summer, how do you regard that move for, for us? Um, probably the worst <laughs> decision we could make with this player. I think it's decision time with this player. I, like I, I could get by loan with an obligation um, to buy. I know there's not a lot of money in the market and things like that at the moment. So I, I could get the kind of we'll give him to you now, but you definitely pay us next summer. Otherwise, we send round fingers and um, friends to bang your door down, and you'll lose a toe and a thumb for every day that we're not paid. Um, but. <laughs> 
but like let's not kick this can down the road we don't need to send him on loan again i i get that again the market's not fantastic this summer and lots of clubs don't have a lot of money and they will definitely have loads of money next summer because all the fans are coming back and that's going to all go off without a hitch obviously <laughs> but <laughs> yeah um, but in, unless there's some, you will definitely get your money next summer. N- no, like don't loan him back. There is no point. Even the the thing is, even like with clubs not having much money this summer, Willock's value, let's take out the economic um, aspect of that, his actual value will not get higher than it is now because he's not going to go and score 38 to 40 Premier League goals <laughs> next year. He'll be. He's got two years left on his contract, so he'll have one year left on his contract. So even if he does have a stellar season, he probably won't pick up that val- that much value anyway. Um, so it, I, I just don't see the point. He's got two years left. We know this player. Arteta presumably knows the way that he wants to. Apologies if you heard my daughter there in the mm-hmm. background. She is she hates also. It. She hates it. Yeah. yeah. She she feels very strongly that we should sell Joe Willock this summer. Um, which just you know proves that my parenting spot on, but but like one like either like this is the summer where it's either sell him for good money, whether you get that money now or next summer, or have a plan for him to be in your team. For me, the only plan that really makes sense for Joe Willock is if we say we're not buying a number ten this summer. Smith Rowe is going to be our first choice, and Willock's going to be like our backup. And I appreciate they're very different in that role and that can have good and bad sides but um i i could get on board with that more i mean i i don't think that's the way i would go personally but i would understand that more than i would understand sending him on loan again so unless it's a loan with an obligation don't bother time to make a decision on this player um yeah it's really tricky because i don't know what a loan accomplishes for us because we loaned him to newcastle once already if we don't think we have room to use him we're basically saying this is not a player who moves the needle for us right now. If we yeah, loan him he, to Newcastle, if he didn't yeah. impress us, if it sorry, if he yeah. didn't impress us enough in this loan spell, just gone. What's he going to do? He's going to be twenty two this summer, <laughs> so he's going to come back, and again, we will be in the same position of we know. Who, look, I think this is something that's really important to bear in mind. Player evaluation is tricky, but if a player you've had since he's a literal child until he's twenty two years old is a player you don't know enough about, you're probably struggling with player evaluation. And that's not to say that players don't change. Of course they change. But you also, like, there is a sense, I think, sometimes that the only time to make a move, buying or selling, is when you're 100% certain it's the right move. That's not how it works. That's like saying the only time I'll sell a stock is when I'm 100% sure it's at the top, and the only time I'll buy is when I'm 100% sure it's at the bottom. You can't do that. You just have to use the information available to make the best decision you can. And so if Arsenal don't feel Joe Willick is a fit for what we want to do, knowing him since he's a child, having seen him till he's 22, then you sell and you cash in and you move on. And sometimes you get that wrong. But by and large, the irony is we've had very few mistakes by selling and a lot of mistakes by not selling. Now, Clive, the thing that I would say with Willick is you could say, how are you going to sell a guy who just scored eight Premier League goals as a midfielder in, you know, 14 starts or whatever the case may be. But I think this is an interesting little sort of, you know where data can help you? Data can help you just sort of take away some of the noisiness to what your eyes tell you. Because look, Joe Willick looked like Leo Messi on his loan. And we know he's probably not Leo Messi. But here's an interesting thing. He played 858 Premier League minutes for us this season before last. He played 979 for Newcastle. Pretty similar. The season before last, he only scored one goal and had one assist. For for Newcastle, he had eight goals and and no assists. You say, wow, I mean, big improvement. Here's the funny thing. For us two seasons ago, he took one and a half shots per 90. For Newcastle, one and a half shots per 90. What was his expected goals for us two seasons ago? 2.3 non-penalty expected goals. What was his expected goals for Newcastle? 2.6 non-penalty expected goals. His non-penalty XG per 90 was the same for us as for Newcastle. You know what the difference is? Joe Willick scored eight goals on 15 open play shots. I mean, literally no player in history has ever done that over any sustained period or ever would again. So the question is, did Joe Willick become something incredible that we didn't realize we had? Or did Joe Willick run hot? 
So to me, obviously, I'm leaning towards my answer, Clive, which is I think Joe Willick ran hot, and I think that means he's probably at a peak of value for a club that should know exactly who he is and whether he's a fit for us. The problem is, what if the best bid we have is $8 million? Well, would you rather just have Joe Willick than the $8 million? What if it's twelve? What if it's sixteen? There's obviously some price at which <clears throat> you sell. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I would say is you don't have to decide on a loan in July. You can let Newcastle get really antsy. Let Newcastle get really nervous. Let Newcastle feel like, gosh, Arsenal aren't going to let us have him. Maybe we do need to raise our bid and just buy him. This is not, you know, it's like with Torreira. If you're planning on just loaning a guy, you can wait to make that choice. So for you, Clive, I mean, is there a clear outcome you'd prefer other than, you know, they give us $30 million and everybody's super happy? Is, is there a clear outcome from the ones you've seen rumored to be possible that you would lean towards with this player? Um, yeah, well, I can't get away from 30 million. That, that makes me happiest. But I do feel a little bit sorry for Arsenal because they, they do the right thing. They have a player that's not really a tactical fit for how they play. They send him on loan and he has a fantastic loan period. He comes back and does really well at that club. He's an immediate fit for that club. Broken play runner, transition team. You know, him and Sam Maximam flying up the pitch, not looking behind them. All good. You know, back free, looking after the back door. He's a fit for that team. He really is. And um, and then when it comes to the cash that other teams get, that Chelsea and Liverpool seem to get, we don't seem to get it. You know, and I, I struggle with that. With my Cassie situation, because they're going for a sale, he doesn't want to spend any money when he knows he's going to sell mm-hmm. the club. And that's what's really unfortunate. So uh, another club, say he did really well at, say, Crystal Palace, and that money would be in the bank already. Mm. You know, and that's, and that's the problem. So I also sort of l- lucked out again. For me, if they do loan him, he's got to be an obligation due to his contract length. They can't just loan him and then all the power goes to the player. So that's that's uh, that's it for me. It's, it's loan with an obligation or a sell. If we keep him, what do we do with him? We just move him around the pitch and fill holes and lose the confidence of the player. The player's now used to playing. Though he was on the bench a few times in Newcastle, but he's used to playing. He's used to feeling important. What cannot happen, <clears throat> excuse me, what cannot happen is he goes back to feeling not so important. And that that will kill careers, that does. And that's what that's what happens with lone people. Once you feel the Saturday buzz, you can't go back to sitting there with us in street clothes. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. So so yeah, I think it's a can Arsenal fit him in tactically. I just don't see it. I don't see how they can do it. He's not a double pivot. He's a he's a different style of ten. Just about to sign up one style of ten and potentially buy another ten. So I just don't see a fit. You can't really play him off the sides. We don't play four four two really really. We don't play four three three. If we were, then hold on a minute, we've got to keep this guy because he can definitely play one of the eights. But I'm not feeling that at the moment and so yeah, it's it's just negotiation. I, I read something today that is there's a bit of a gap between the US tour and they're trying to push this through. What does this look like? That's the key thing. And um Newcastle fans want him. They really want him. So let's just hold let's hold on, right, and see if we can test their nerve. I let agree me, with you. Let, let me stay with you for a second though, Clever. So I think we sort of agree. It is about getting the fee that we think is is right. I think 30 million was, ne- I mean, if we can see that Willick was on an unreal hot streak and probably isn't a 30 million player, I, I think it's probably ridiculous to expect that Newcastle don't see that either. Um, but I do think 20 million is, is a price that I would sell yeah. him for. But, but setting that aside, like, plus, plus add ons, yeah. that, looks, that looks good to me. Yeah, you that, know what I mean? That, that makes perfect and, sense. And, and, you know, there are a lot of people Clive, that would say, well, you're selling into a deflated market, but you're also buying in that deflated market. The funny thing is, 20 million pounds for Willick is more than what uh, Awar is being quoted at, because I think they're quoted, he's quoted at like 25 million euro. So when you start to look at it that way, that's a sale that buys you something that, that's a lot more valuable to us than will it can be right now. But I'll stay with you just for a second, Clive, to ask, I mean, how do you look at Joe Willick in terms of the fact that the club should really know this player, right? Like, if you raise a, a player from the time he's a kid to the time he's 22... And I realize coaching changes and things like that, but information travels and this player has played for Arteta and he's played for these academy coaches and it's not like you can't pick up the phone and call Freddie and say, Freddie, give me the book on this player. Like, we should know what he is. 
<clears throat> it seems pretty clear to me, to your point, he's not a double pivot. His passing is not what it needs to be to play next to a Thomas party. His defensive, you know, he's not a Basuma. He's not going to clean up uh, defensively behind Thomas party. But he's not a 10 in a 4-2-3-1. We have Smith Rowe for that. It looks like we're going for another player like a Madison or Noir there. And I don't think his technical level is high enough with the cute passing. I mean, again, he had no assists for Newcastle. That's not really what he's about. He is a a guy who, even if he's not a, you know, a goal scorer like he showed at Newcastle, can get into the box and cause some devastation there. But almost like a Griezmann second striker type. You know, a guy who runs into the box and scores. He's an elite ball carrier. But if you don't want him playing deeper, I don't know what that gets you. So can it be the case sometimes, Clive, that a player has some really good skills, but the way those skills layer together, there's no good way to deploy them for a club or for our club in particular? Yeah, I, I don't. When you say he's not a 10, he's not, he's not a classic 10. You know, he's more of a, a tear array, run around 10, you know, distraction 10. You know, this is the sort of thing that. No, and people talk about Aaron Ramsey as a ten. He wasn't really a ten. He's one of his best position was really what he did for Wales, really. Mm. One of two tens behind the forward. And you know, and they were just the connection between Bowell and Ramsey was was a key thing for him. I always felt Ramsey was a third midfielder or a or fourth forward, if you see what I mean. You know, that's what I always thought he was. I said same with Willow. If he has the right centre forward in front of him, you know, a stand up guy that posts up and and causes, uh, looks after people, attracts people, and he can just be active. And he's quite, he smells it. He smells it in the box. You know, he arrives, you can't deny it. He, he can drop in when they're under pressure, and he can carry, and he smells chances. And, you know, funny enough, he's in a team system that really brought out all of his strengths and covered all of his weaknesses. And he had a really hot time. Now, if I'm Newcastle, I'm thinking, well, we're not really going to change that style of play. We don't really have ball retention players in the centre of the pitch. We're a broken field team, and we've got a couple of real sprinty attacking forwards, and he was one of them, and we needed those legs because we lack legs. You know, we lack legs in our central area. So he was just perfect for them, and he just flourished, knowing he was important. And I do hear you say about the stats, but, you know, I think sometimes you can walk into a room that fits you, and that's it, you're off and running. So I also know what they have, and I just think he doesn't fit us. But if we were to change how we attack, we were to change our system, then it would fit us. But I'm not sensing that from the Arteta quotes. I'm not feeling the love. I'm thinking there's a transaction to be made, and I'll sort of negotiate quietly in the background. So it is what it is, mate. You can't keep them all. And um, he's been at the club since he was six years of age. And if we were to get 20 million for him, he's done nothing but good things for us. In the Europa League, he's developed and we've made 20 million pounds from him. Tick, success story. Mm. I I just don't, yeah. I don't see that you need to change it that way. I mean, I, I, I mean, change it that way. I don't think you need to, to, to change anything from what you said there in the sense that, like, Clive, I think also what people think of as success with, a, with an academy kid is it like he turns into... A superstar. But most academy kids won't. If an academy kid turns into a good player who goes to a Premier League team for 20 million pounds, that is a huge win for your academy. And, yeah, I just, um, like, I, 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 I don't know that we have the right attitude about the academy kids sometimes because we love them so much and we want to see what's really good about them. But what we have to realize is that I think the ones that are really special tend to show it pretty quickly. I mean, you look at Bukayo and Smith Rowe, and you knew really, really quickly when they got into the first team that there's something special there. And then you look at guys like Maitland-Niles and Enkedia and Willock, where two seasons down the road of having seen them play quite a bit, we're still all debating whether they'll ever really be good enough for Arsenal. I think that tells you a lot. I think that tells you a lot. Um, the different, And you could say, well, they don't all need to be Sackas and Smith Rowe's. I get it. But that's the level we're shooting for with players in the first team. Um, and there's the other point that Willock's going to be into the final season of his contract next summer. So whatever value he maybe adds to himself if he plays really well for Newcastle this season, guess what? You lose that value by the fact that you've lost some negotiating leverage. So something's going to have to be done with him next season. And I don't think Joe Willock's going to be eager to sign a new contract having not earned a place in the team. So you're just kicking the can down the road to a decision that's going to be where we're going to have less leverage a summer from now. We'll finish on the Willock thing 
um, Tim, by just basically asking you, I mean, setting aside what we should do with him, what's your evaluation mm -hmm. of him? I mean, I, I think there are people that are higher on him than I am. There are people that are lower mm -hmm. on him than I am, and I accept that. But, like, it can be true that a player can be good, but not quite what we need. Good, yep. but not quite a fit for us. And if anyone should know, you know, it's hard enough trying to decide if Awar is going to be a fit for us or, well, you know, will Ben White be a fit for us? But when a guy has been with you since he's a tiny child till he's 22, you should, you should kind of know, right? You should, you should know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, I, I see Newcastle as uh, like that kind of area, you know, Newcastle, Crystal Palace type area of the league as, as pretty ideal for him. I, I think he's 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 a real type of player, isn't he? And you, you, your team needs to play in such a way um, to get, or be built in such a way to get the best out of a player like that. I mean, ideally, he either needs to play in a team with a four-three-three that has you know more of a I guess a double pivot or a, a six and an eight in there. Um, so, like Clive says, not quite a ten, but you know a, a free eight, as it were. Um, or he needs to play in a team like Newcastle, who don't seek to monopolise the ball and who counter-attack, who try to break at speed, who have players like Almiron, Saint-Maximin, Joe Linton, um, and and just need someone to break forward. Mm -hmm. I think the real clue here is, and I, I don't want to be like unkind to Willock here, but he didn't start a lot of Newcastle. Get, well, he started a fair amount, but he was on the bench quite a bit at Newcastle, which kind of says that they're aware of his limitations. And he kind of fell into this super sub role, which, which is fine, by the way. And he evidently played it very, very well. But I think if Newcastle are, you know, whether that was, I doubt that, I think the reason that Arsenal would struggle to really make him part of the starting eleven is due to his technical shortcomings. I imagine with Newcastle, it's more because of his kind of going the other way. Um, but that's that's two quite significant shortcomings if you're talking about playing for an elite team, in yeah. my view. He's he's clearly got a, a big superpower, which is breaking into the box and scoring goals. And, and that is great. And that will take him very far in his career. I, I don't think it will quite take him to Arsenal um, or, or at least the level that we aspire to be at. Um, but I, I think if you, I, I think he's perfect for Newcastle. Basically, I completely understand why they're interested in retaining him. I think he'd be great at even like a Burnley running onto knockdowns from Ashley Barnes um, and the likes and breaking forward in more of a four four two. Could see him doing that. Um, he, he's just he's a very specific type of player, and I I don't think and and I think to be honest, that type of player, unless you're absolutely elite at that. Um, or your Aaron Ramsey or someone like that. Generally, that player thrives at teams who don't dominate the ball. I think that, you know, the hard thing too is Aaron Ramsey gets evoked a lot because of guys who run into the box and score goals from midfield. But Aaron Ramsey was a pretty elite passer, had an incredible engine to get back and defend. And I mean, even then, he got criticism from Arsenal fans for not defending enough. The irony is like Aaron Ramsey, who was elite in many, many ways, very elite divided some fans at Arsenal, as crazy as that sounds. Um, you know, Joe Willick has deficiencies that are, I think, a lot more glaring. And I, I want to make a point here, though, about fandom. If your attitude is, he's an academy kid who I love, and I would rather watch him play for Arsenal than the likes of Ceballos and El Elneny. If those are the caliber players we're going to have at Arsenal, I'd rather it be an academy kid who's fun and I like than mediocre players like El Elneny and Ceballos, who are eye-wateringly dull to watch and don't excite me and aren't connected to our club. I yeah, totally get that. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, and you know, you talked um, a lot about the the money Willock might generate, and I think you're absolutely right, but he has done a job for the team as well, albeit as a squad player, but he's played in some of those Europa League group games for the last couple of years, and he's done well, and he's that's meant that we don't have to play, you know, the more senior players or run their legs off. Same with Nketiah. You know, we've played him in cup games. He scored goals. He's probably not quite the next level. That is fine. That is absolutely fine. It is much better to have players like Willock and Nketiah do that. Like, you don't have to pay Willock and Nketiah to fuck off in January because you don't want them anymore because they're sitting on pensions. Those guys, they want to go. Maitland-Niles at the moment. I'm, I'm sure that Arteta, in his 
like in his heart of hearts would love to keep Maitland Niles as that utility player. He probably doesn't want that. He will be itching to go somewhere else. And that's what you that's why you use youth players in these roles, because you get some use out of them. And if and when you decide you don't want them anymore, they do not sit there and go, Nope, I've I've got a very nice pension plan here. Thank you very much. I've got gym privileges, lunch in the London can London Colney Canteen, wonderful. They want to go. And and that's fine. Your squad players should roll over because if you're if you've got a squad player who wants to stay for four years, <clears throat> Cedric, their motives are not correct. Okay, you you want your squad players who want to get into the team, and if they can't get into the team, they want to go. You get that with young players. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. And it, it, it <laughs> I know I know that like there are going to be people that are just shaking their head saying eight goals in eleven starts from midfield and we want to get rid of that when we don't have goals, I would just remind you again that like he got those eight goals from 15 open play shots. I mean, it is an incredible hot streak that has elevated his value. We kind of got a blessing in disguise in that he did that because the irony is he shot at the same. We can't capitalize on that, on that blessing in disguise. Well, that yeah, I mean, we kind of need to, don't we? <laughs> that's sort of the... Yeah, well, we, we may not be able to. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the uh, unfortunate thing. Right? But I wouldn't dismiss it as, as a total hot streak. You have to also take into account the player's going to improve. He's now done it. He's got the confidence of executing in the league, you know, each Saturday. So, um, yeah, under pressure, by the way, in a relegation <laughs> fight, scoring at Anfield, scoring against Spurs. You know, there's going to be something else on the back of this. You know, it's not just a a freak of nature. This, this player has got really good attributes. They just don't fit our eye of what we see as a central midfielder with a double pivot or a number 10 or a winger in a 4 2 3 one. He doesn't fit any of those roles unless it's a specific 10 role, which we don't do every single week. You yeah. Know? So, um... So yeah, no, I don't. I don't dismiss his talent. I think he's got. I think he's really quite technical in a certain way, to break, to beat his man, to punch through lines. He's not a metronomic technician. He's a driving technician at speed, shooting on the run, crossing mm-hmm. at speed, everything at speed in the air. He's excellent. You know, so it's just because he doesn't fit our eye. I don't dismiss his talents. His talents to getting where he is are. Well, it's not I'm just really our eye, it's our, it's our setup, right? Like where, where yeah, we would deploy point. him. Yeah. Well, I mean, our eye, you know, the Arsenal eye, you know, the right, Arsenal yeah. fans eye, you know, the way we play, the way we see our tens, we throw, bang, immediately fits our eye. We've seen that before. Odegaard, Smith, Rowe, yeah, those those. T- yeah, we like those tippy-tappy and... players, flip it out of their feet, change the angle, change the point, move it, get it back, Cruyff turn around the other side. We like that. We've seen that for 20 years, right? So that's easy for us to recognize. So, um... Joe Willicks, that's new for us. You know, you said things about Aaron Ramsey's elite passing. Aaron Ramsey was a steady passer, but he was an elite arriver. Yeah. Right? He's a, he's a disruptive player. Right? And he developed his retention skills throughout his career. In the early phase of his career, he was pretty loose on the ball. Mm. You know, tried a lot of risky flicks and got criticized by me, for yeah. sure. Right? So, um, so then he developed more... Experience, I like using that word for Tim. He develops some experience uh, under pressure and delivered at the biggest moments, and that's when he's really, you know, that's when his career really took off, right? So, yeah. don't I don't dismiss Joe Willow. I just don't dismiss what, when people can do that. Yeah, you know, I, I, don't. I don't think you should dismiss it. I think the other thing that's hard is Joe Willock. What are his two superpowers? Carrying the ball long distances, which is a very dynamic skill, and arriving in the box to score, which is a very dynamic skill. And in the Twitter highlights, YouTube comp era of football, Joe Willock is a really easy on the eye guy to fall for because when a big athletic midfielder is striding through with the ball at his feet, driving past players and then arriving in the box and scoring, that looks great. And you might be screaming at me now, that doesn't just look great, that is great. Why don't we want that? But the problem is that a lot of the game, especially in Arsenal, is played having to pass the ball five yards, having to deliver on time, having to play at tempo, having to keep the ball moving, having to be alive off the ball for your defensive responsibilities. And I I don't know that those skills are there and those are harder things to put into a YouTube comp. Um, I can tell you that 
for a guy who is in the elite percentiles for goal scoring in midfield, even with his hot streak notwithstanding, he's you know in the like two percent for passing. So the question is, can you tolerate that? Let, let's move off the Joe Willick topic. I think my sort of fair stopping point on him is to simply say. I do not dismiss anyone who loves the player, who loves that he's from our academy, who would like to see him thrive with us and is sick of players like even a Shaka, a Ceballos, an El Nenny, and says, if we're going to be eighth, pushing to try to be sixth, I'd rather we be doing it with Reese Nelson, Joe Willick, and Eddie Nketiah than Lacazette, Danny Ceballos, El Nenny, and Shaka. I am absolutely open to that. But I think if we want to be pushing for first, which is where we want to go, We're going to have to make hard calls and hard calls on academy players we like. This is one of them. I know it's polarizing. I know there will be people who have agreed with this conversation and people who have been frustrated by it. But uh, whatever the outcome, I, I think what everyone would probably agree on is if Joe Willick stays with Arsenal this season with no Europe, he's going to find it very difficult without a clear role to get in the team and play and contribute. And that's not good for Joe Willick. So if you love Joe Willick, him being at Arsenal this season, not having much of a role is not great. If we had Europa League this season and we couldn't get the fee we wanted, rather than loaning him out at 22, I'd say give him all the Europa League group games and let's get one final look at who this player is. But we don't. And one year left on his contract next summer means kicking this can down the road doesn't help him or us much. Um, I want to do this. I, I, I want to talk about the preseason game, about Willian, and about some of the comments that... Uh, Arteta made. I just want to quickly ask you about something, Tim, that's sort of out in left field, but I'm so petty. Did you know that I'm petty? Have either of you guys noticed how Um, petty I am? No, 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 not at all. Not at all, good. Um, I I have to ask, how do you feel about seeing pictures of Edu partying with Raul and Kia (laughs) Drabshian? Yeah, I mean, so I, I kind of think on one hand, I kind of think, well, you know, if there is friends and, you know, it's his private life or whatever, then, you know, it's none of my business. It, it depends, really, what he was there for. If it's because, you know, he's seeing some old work colleagues and I hope that Kia is a former work colleague as well, not a, a present one, fine. If they're there doing deals, um, you know, and that would more likely be with Kia, obviously, than, than Raul, who I don't think has a job at the moment. Um, that would be more concerning. So it it depends, really. If it was just him catching up with some mates, it's none of my business. But if it's Arsenal business they were doing, I'd be incredibly concerned. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard, right? Because like people are allowed to have the friends they have. Um, but when the the criticism of the arrangement was that it was too buddy buddy that these relationships were toxic for Arsenal and poisoning decision making, and you see Kia and and, and Raúl and Adu in that picture, it's just a reminder, like. Adu wasn't some poor, unfortunate soul who was sort of tarred by the presence of Raul and Kia. No. He's in that group. He's in that yeah, group. Yeah. And that's He's why he was hired. a long-time associate of Kia. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard to, to, to separate those. I will say they all looked very sharp. They all looked very good. It looked like a very nice party. I have no doubt. Clive, I, I don't know if you have any doubt. I have no doubt that all of them manscaped before that party. And I think if you are invited to a similar party, whether in Las Vegas or whether with a super agent, to get you a new four-year deal at better wages, even though you've packed on maybe a few extra stone, a few extra pounds, the important thing to do is make sure that you are clean cut, that you are well-shaped, because who knows what the activities were after the party. I mean, that looked like a lavish event. You want to be clean head to toe, and the best way to do it is with the performance package 4.0 for Manscaped. And you can do it so affordably because you can go to manscaped.com and use promo code ARSENALVISION and you will get 20% off and free worldwide shipping all over the world. 20% off free worldwide shipping. When you go to manscaped.com, promo code ARSENALVISION, what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get the lawnmower 4.0, first things first. Things first. That's something you have to have because not only is it their latest version with ceramic blades and skin-safe technology so it doesn't cut, it doesn't nick. I mean, if you if you have an old rusty razor sitting in your shower right now, And every time you get in the shower, you're like, I should shave down there, but look at that thing. It's terrifying. It's just waiting to hurt me. Don't do that. Use this. It's waterproof. It can go in the shower. It can do the whole body. It comes with guards, so you can do eyebrows and stuff like that if you need to. Sideburns. You do your whole head. Clive, just throwing it out there. I mean, the point is, this thing is awesome. And it has now the new 4.0 just has a, a contact induction charger, so you just set it in its little cradle, and it just charges up. I haven't had to charge my lawnmower in like a month and a half. 
it goes for so long, has a really high LED flashlight. The button has a lock, so it won't start lawn mowing inside your travel kit. Comes with the travel kit, comes with tonics and lotions and um, an amazing nail kit. Because, you know, that that's something as a guy that I just ignore, but then my wife was like, your cuticles are gross, please do something about it. So the nail kit has files and clippers and uh, slant edge tweezers. They just have great products. They package them beautifully. They send them wonderfully. It even comes with a, a fake newspaper in the package. It tells you all about manscaping today and what you need to know. So go there, manscaped.com, promo code Arsenal Vision, 20% off and free worldwide shipping. And uh, you too will look your best when a super agent invites you out for a posh dinner and drinks to get you an improved four-year deal into your dotage. Uh, Clive, has had enough of that? Oh, yes. Very much so. Okay. So Come then on. let's stay on topic. Willian, Clive, I want to be clear about something because I, I, I want to make sure that people understand. We do not believe in any kind of slurs or shaming or anything. And body shaming is despicable and nobody should do it. Having said that, a professional athlete is meant to stay in shape. And we know that Willian can stay in shape. This is not a body shaming thing. This is a professional athlete who has chosen to enjoy his summer holiday in the way he sees fit and has come back in a shape that is not the one you expect of a professional footballer. So how do you feel if you're Mikel Arteta and your expensively paid huge disappointment shows back up for preseason, totally unashamed to be carrying uh, quite a few extra pounds in his belly? I mean, I get it. These guys can cut weight real quick and get into shape real quick, but he's not a kid anymore, which also makes me sad. How would you feel if, you know, if you're Arteta and this player shows up in that shape, just happy to stretch out that new away yellow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many, many years ago, I went on holiday once to Cyprus and I just happened to be at the same place as Kevin Phillips. And and basically he's played for Sunderland, good player, played for England. And we used to go running every day. And he was on holiday, every day. And it was like the first time I realized that these pros just don't really stop. They work hard all the time, right? And that was many years ago. And I'm sure everyone's been looking at the Instagrams of Aubameyang and Willock and Nelson training and El Nenny with a little bit of his high-intensity work. <laughs> and they're all doing their work. I didn't see any Willian Instagrams, I must admit. And I certainly now I know why, right? So um, it's a bit of a shame, actually. He's joking aside. There are normally rules. You, you come back, you get measured, you get tested, you're... Your fat content gets tested and you get pinch tested. And, you know, there are normally rules for this sort of stuff. And um, and that's why the players do it. They have a summer program. They go away and they follow that program. They send the details in. They text it into their strength and conditioning coach, what what their times are for their 5Ks, et cetera. They do their work and they send the details in. That's what they do. And that really disappoints me. And joking aside, it does show a lack of professionalism. You know, and I heard you say something the other day, Elliot, and I thought of a greedy as I was on my walk today. What sort of example are you setting the young kids, right? This is a guy that's on big wages. This is a guy that turns up in the biggest cars. The young kids look at him and think, well, mate, I'm beating you in the runs on training. That's not good. You know, Bamiyang, maybe our, you know, he's, we've seen the work he's doing. And I bet you he's towards the front of the running and the, the, the fitness tests. And that's what should happen. If you're a senior pro, you've got to come back like a senior pro. And that, to me, does not enamor him any further with the Arsenal fans who uh, may have been wavering on their love for him. Well, also, <laughs> I especially, I mean, Clive, especially if he, he doesn't still want to be here and maybe we are looking for a move for him and we are trying to convince people, I mean, we're not going to get money for him and we're probably going to have to eat a portion of his wages, but we're trying to convince someone he's still a committed professional, you're still going to get good football from him um, and we'll eat some of his wages. And they look at this and they say, this doesn't strike me as a guy who's still committed to his profession. It doesn't help us, doesn't help us achieve that goal either, does it? <laughs> it, it? It doesn't. And it really epitomizes what's happened since he's left Chelsea. I mean, it's, just, it's obvious to me. Um, Chelsea's in his heart and... Uh, Arsenal's convenient, and then that's it. And we were suckers enough to um, load ourselves up with three years of heavy payments. And so now we have to mitigate that that damage and mitigate that risk we, under, we undertook. And it's going to cost us. So wherever he goes, we'll be paying for him. I guarantee you of that. We'll be paying for him. No one's going to take that full wage on. Right? So, um, so, yeah, another great deal. Another great deal. Mates looking after our mates. Mm. It's not really... So. 
not really encouraging, but hopefully we're leaving some of that behind. No, yes, no, I don't want to trade in stereotypes and I don't want to continue on this conversation too much longer because giving William this much attention is probably more than we want this early in the preseason. But um, Tim, is there is there a a um, a cultural thing here? Is there like a and again, I, I don't want to trade in stereotypes. I could be way, way off base. Mm. So, some people had reached out and been like, oh, you see this with some of the older Brazilian players where they reach a stage where they just kind of like start to enjoy life a little more, but you know, it's no big deal. Mm. Is this, is this a thing culturally? I mean, I know there are a few very celebrated Brazilian players who have gone through a phase like this, but is, is that, yeah. is there a thing there? No. Yeah. 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 There is. Um, I'd, I'd say, you know, like Brazilian footballers, it's the biggest diaspora in the world, right? There are Brazilian footballers in every league. Um, and kind of emigration out of Brazil, I can tell you from personal experience, it like happens a lot because it's just one of those countries where there are enough people who can afford to emigrate, who kind of want to emigrate. Um, and and in football, you know, you get you, there are loads of Brazilian players in China, um, Russia, you know, clubs like that. And, you know, Angie in uh, Russia, when they had loads of money, loads of Brazilian players tipped up there, you know, it, it, it does happen. Um, but then, you know, you obviously you get on the flip side of that, you get people like Kaká and Gilberto Silva. Uh, Danny Alves is like knocking 38 and he's going to the Olympics and he David wants to Louis go to the World Cup. Shape. Yeah, yeah. Chago Silva is 37 and he's with Chelsea and he's captaining Brazil. Like, you know, it, it does kind of go both ways. Stereotypes I think tend to be survivorship bias, right? Like if four yeah, Brazilian yeah. players turn up larger in their early 30s, then you say, look, this is a Brazilian thing when actually it's just yeah, those two yeah. players. And, <laughs> and, and also there's a mat, like there's 210 million people um, in that country. <laughs> and like, I think about 105 million of them are footballers. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's just like, there's a, a, a mass of them, if you'll forgive. Um, but, but no, it does happen. I, I think the thing that surprises me is Willian has always, um, I think really accurately been fated for his professionalism when he was at Angie actually in Russia, he was at Shakhtar, you know, he came through that stable where, you know, Sh Shakhtar is a great place for Brazilian players to go by yeah. the way, mm -hmm. because it, it really has become like a finishing school. Um, that kind of bridge move between when you go from Brazil to Europe and William came from that. And, and at Chelsea, he was as much as he could divide opinion at times. Nobody ever doubted his level of professionalism. It was it was the reason coaches loved him. And it was it was the reason why a lot of fans liked him and he had respect to players. So he for, you know, whatever you th ever thought of him as a player in his career. And he he's always been much better than what we've seen at Arsenal. He's always been renowned as, as a great professional. So, and and I thought naively at the beginning of the summer, I kind of said, I think he might be willing to make a move happen because he might not have given up on the idea of going to another World Cup with Brazil at the end of next year because Dani Alves will probably go and he'll be nearly 39. Thiago Silva will definitely go to that World Cup and he'll be 38. Like, they're not, they're not above, like, picking players in their in their kind of late 30s if they're still in good nick um but i mean it looks to me like he's entirely given up on that idea um now so uh yeah it, it and and to your point elliot what's really disappointing is this probably um you know really puts a bullet in any kind of move for him because you can um kind of sell it as well he's still a good player this has just proved to be a bad move for him um and you can sell that to like into Miami or whoever else, but um, yeah, it's 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 harder to shift this um, yeah. in more ways than one. Yeah, I definitely don't buy into the 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 stereotype Brazil angle of it. I just I think it's player by player. I mean, Eden Hazard showed up in Real Madrid like very very overweight, but I think by the end he had actually cut most of it. Um, and Eden Hazard always had a bit of a prodigious backside to begin with. Um, well, so, so Tim, in terms of that first preseason game, I know you are a big believer that these things, it's its silly to even televise them. They're mostly fitness exercises, stuff like that. I think the thing that is interesting in preseason is just sort of reminding yourself of the squad you have and the work that needs to be done when you take a few key pieces out. Um, mm -hmm. The first half, that wasn't anything like an Arsenal team. I mean, Colossi, and William are players we want no part of. Cedric, you know, you could argue as well. Aubameyang's our star striker, yeah. and the rest of them are literal children. Um, the obvious unfortunate thing from the game is Okonkwa, uh having 
a bit of a mare. And I mean, who cares? No big deal. But his first yeah, time yeah. pulling on the shirt for the first team, and he sort of flaps it at a cross that he slaps tamely towards a, an onrushing attacker, thankfully comes to nothing. And then a, a really embarrassing goal. Uh, Cedric doing him no favors, by the way, by <laughs> passing mm-hmm. it back to him in the most complex way possible. But in terms of that first half of the game is really the only takeaway. I think, I guess there's two. There's that and there's Enkedia missing clear-cut chances for a player who's probably also very much at the a, a different end of his Arsenal career as an academy player, a guy who maybe it's wrapping up for him. So are those the takeaways for you from that first half, the Enkedia miss and the, mm-hmm. the Okonkwa rough seas? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and look, the Enketia miss as well. I'd, I'd probably put that down to a bit of rustiness in three weeks. He'll probably put that in the back of the net, mm. um, and and that and, it, and and again in that in this sense, that's what these games are for, like bringing those kind of those uh, those smoothing out those edges again. On um, on a conquest, I think you're right to point out the back pass from Cedric. A- again, maybe can be generous to him and say, well, it's preseason for him too, um, and maybe in three weeks he won't make a pass like that or a decision like that, but. You know, to Clive's point, really, well, the biggest, the most disappointing thing about last season was the failure of the experienced players to look after um, the young players rather than just like watching them get on with it. Um, and, you know, if, if you're going to sign like a 29 year old on a four year deal, what you really want from them at least is to show that kind of um, that kind of level headedness and experience. But, you know, it's a preseason game. It's preseason for Cedric too, et cetera, et cetera. So not hugely bothered about that one. On on a con quote, I mean, you can take it two ways. You can kind of say, well, yeah, get that out of the way now. Much rather you do that in um, a preseason friendly against the Hibs team, by the way, who are much further into their preseason. I think they might have some qualifiers of some sort and the Scottish season starts earlier anyway. Um, so I think they've had a few games, but you can look, you can look at it as, well, you know, yeah, get those nerves out of the way now. He's just obviously he's just had the new contract. He's just been kind of announced as the number three, which sounds to me like Runison is going one way or another. Um, so you, you you can say, okay, well, you know, you've got that out of your system now. On the other hand, you could kind of look at it as, oh wow, if if you were nervous for a preseason friendly against Hibs that no one's watching, um, you know, I. And and I guess um, the the thing I've got to prime myself out of is not to judge young goalkeepers by the standards when it comes to nerves of, of Wojciech Szczesny. Um, I, in fact, I don't even think I just judge like goalkeepers like that. I think just I I think I judge people by mm. Wojciech Szczesny in general. But <laughs> there, there is a big part of me that thinks, well, he might have made that mistake, but probably not out of nerves, um, because Okonkwo did look nervous on a few things, but. I mean, on that, I think, again, I, I get the impression. Arteta's already said he's going to play against Rangers. And, you know, if he's fine in that, then I think you can kind of say it's a one-off. But a bit later in preseason, if he's still shown some of those nerves, then maybe you kind of say, OK, um, you know, maybe this guy needs a loan or something, um, which, which might happen anyway. Um, but I, it's it's not something to be enormously concerned about at this stage. Yeah, yeah, I I'm not worried at all. I just sort of feel bad for him. I, I said this on yeah. the, the instant reaction pod. I think it is a reminder of, I was thinking about Bukayo Saka trying to step up and score a penalty in the Euro finals to keep England alive against Italy and the pressure he's under at 19. And then thinking, look at Okonkwa. Here's another 19 year old who's nervous making his first start for Arsenal against Hibs in preseason. Nervous enough to make those kind of errors. Because clearly, he's not a player that does that regularly. We wouldn't be talking about him as a talent that we're re-signing. That's clearly an error that comes from the six inches between your ears. The You know, the nerves. And if a player at 19 can be nervous about starting for Arsenal against Hibs in the preseason, now try to put into context trying to strike that penalty for England at 19. It's just incredible yeah. The, the 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 pressure he must have been under. And by the way, Saka has put out a statement on social media that I think is obviously well written, beautifully uh, said, and and powerful, and and definitely one to go read. But uh, you know, sort of thanks to people that got behind him, criticizes the people that sent hateful messages. But I think the most important thing he says is that he he will not be weakened by this. He will not be diminished by this, and he's determined to come back stronger than ever. And I I think some people say that with Bukayo Saka, I don't have any concern. So I think that absolutely will happen. Clive, for the for the preseason game, 
Setting aside the Aconqua thing, you know, we did get a look at Enkedia, Nelson, Maitland-Niles. Nelson got to play sort of the 10, Maitland-Niles in central midfield positions they'd like. Um, uh, Enkedia, I guess, is the second striker. It was almost like 4-4-2. I, the, the formation was weird, but the players out there were weird. I guess what I would say to you is, you know, preseason may not matter, strictly speaking, in terms of results and stuff, but it does matter for players who are right on the fringe with careers hanging in the balance. And I would put all of Maitland-Niles, Nelson, and Enkedia in that category. So it, in terms of preseason generally, is it a big one for those three? Uh, or would you guess that all of their futures are probably pretty much sorted in the minds of the club by now? Yeah, the most important thing for them is to train and not get injured. Mm-hmm. If they get injured, they, they're in trouble because then they're not in control of their next step because no one's going to buy an injured player. So they're just going for the motions. So scratch, you know, scratch them off. The, the real ones where it's important is for the youngsters because they're given a chance in the first team environment. So they're going to be training with them, running with them, eating with them. And so this is key to see how they adapt in that environment uh, from a mental perspective, you know, how they cope around people that they've seen on TV, you know. So they that's really important, how they assimilate into the group. And then when they play, can they play at the intensity levels? Can they keep the ball? Do they understand how they want to play? It's a great experience introduction into the first team professional environment. So when they go back to the under 23s or want to go on loan, they can carry that with them. So players like the goalkeeper, that's an important time for him, you know, to play with, you know, senior players at Arsenal. That's an important time. The young defender called Harry Clark, I think he was away at, um, I want to say it's which I might be wrong. But, um, Again, it's an important time for him to play with um, the first team players. Omar Rekic, again, you know, someone I've not seen yet. And and so, yeah, Maitland Niles jogging around the centre of the pitch, just going through the motions. Not, you know, he knows he wants to get away. He's made that really, really clear. It's just a matter of which which club's going to come from. Is it going to be Watford? Is it going to be Palace? Which one is, who's it going to be? But he mustn't get injured, and so, from my own point of view, I want you know I want to see you know the ones who are going to be here, you know like the Balogun, for example. I, I the Balogun, I called him <laughs> the Smith. The, the Smith. Balogun. The Smith. <laughs> the Smith is a thing, but as yet, the Balogun is not a thing. <laughs> uh, the Balogun. I want to see him. I want to see what he does. You know, because you know, I just I've got I just think I'm a bit of a fan, right? I want to see how where he goes. Is he going to be a unbelievable youth player that can't transmit that to senior level, or is he going to be someone come to senior level and say, right, I'm here, you lot are in trouble? And so I'm I'm looking at him a lot to see how he plays, what how physical he gets, and what he does around the ball, how he combines. I'm really going to be looking at him most of the preseason. He's, he's going to be my one that my eyes on the most. Yeah, I I think then I'll just quickly ask you. Well, yeah, let's throw it in now since since you mentioned Balogun. I, I mean, Balogun being in the first team would be interesting. There's some people that would like to see Martinelli play at striker. We have Lacazette and Aubameyang in the team, but there's a question of whether Lacazette should move on, which raises the interesting question of our links to Tammy Abraham. Clive, I am going to surprise a lot of people by saying I actually really rate Tammy Abraham, and I think he was a very hyped player who put up some very interesting numbers in the championship, went to a club that doesn't, give a lot of room for players of his ilk to thrive and we're sort of post hype for a player who's still young and has proven he can do it. Um, it, Some people might say it's a really mid table sounding move. Some people would say it's a really savvy move. Um, Sort of like what Lester did with an Ian Acho. What's your take on Tammy Abraham and whether striker is a position that Arsenal really need to start thinking about strongly? Yeah, I, I knew you'd like Tammy Aram because the data likes him. Right? Oh, uh, now, don't see. reduce me just to that one thing. I'm that <laughs> I mean, I plus like interruptions. <laughs> because if I, said, if I said to you, you know, he's he's decent pace, he's average in the air, he's okay off his left foot, he's okay off his right foot, he doesn't really post up very well, doesn't really pin people down, he's quite mobile, but he does he does some good stuff some of the time. And, and that's what he is. You know, he's definitely not 40 million for me. No, no, I, I want to be clear. No, there's no chance I'd pay forty million for Tammy Abraham. But as a striker who's well, about to turn twenty four, you know, meaning he's coming into his best years, and as a striker who, you know, has, I mean, let's be clear, he had twenty five goals at twenty years old in the championship, and for Chelsea, 
in 25 starts, he had 15 goals in the Premier League. So this isn't a guy where the data likes him, but we haven't seen it or he's been doing it in France. Like, that's that's not bad. I mean, here's, here's a wild stat. For Bristol in the championship when he was 18, 23 goals. So the elite young talent is, I mean, you see what I'm saying, right? This isn't just a yeah. guy where you're kind of like oh, guessing no. he could be good. Like he's shown something, you know? No, I'll tell you what, if you want to look at my history on my Twitter, you'll see that I was talking about him for Arsenal about four years ago. Yeah, that was the time. <laughs> uh, I happen to know I happen to know somebody close to Chelsea, and I, and I heard, I used to talk about Dominic Solanke, who was doing quite well at the time, and they shut me down and said, nope, the one to watch is Tammy Abraham. He's the one that's at the club working late. He's the one that's doing the finishing drills. He's the one that does all the extras. And he, he's the one that's going to be here longer than Dominic Slanky. And that was exactly what happened, mm-hmm. you know? And um, and so, yeah, this, but I look at it now, I think I'm just sick of putting money in Chelsea's pocket. Yeah, so well, I hear you Go there. out and spend it elsewhere. At least he's I'm not sick 32. Of taking, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm just done with it. Because how can you compete with somebody when you're taking people off them they don't want? The mental message is just not great, you know, whether they're young or not. If you're taking a Tariq Lamptey off them because he wouldn't sign a contract and you can get him for three million, that's good. But like, there are some youth players at Chelsea you want to be taking, right? The, that's good because they haven't got a pathway there. But I don't want to be taking their prime age players. I don't want to be taking, I don't mind Pulisic, by the way, but I don't want to be <laughs> taking their prime age players. And I, and, I, and I don't want to be taking their older players because I want to, I want to either rip them out because I don't want to lose them or, you know, leave it alone. Leave it alone because it's time for us to stand up and take them on. You know, we've got to stand up and take them on. They are, they are our competitors. They're sitting there with two European Cups where we're messing about, taking their old men from them. It's just, it's just not right, you know. So I have a bit of a a fan bias there against their players. I'm not stupid to the fact that Tony Pan can play football. I know he can play football. I know we have a couple of forwards with receding hairlines at, at Arsenal that need to need to be moving on soon. And it's just which one? Now, Lacazette's running around like a two-year-old. But I think, you know, he's the one that's blocking, actually. So, um, Aubameyang, we hope, can return to some form of form and spark. But we're not sure. Mm. You know, so that's one to watch. So, um, so yeah, it's a very complex situation, our forward line. It is not clear, and it's blocked. It's really blocked with, and we spoke about William earlier, with people that we've seen the best of, and they're very expensive, and there's a block there, and there's a, there's a defining forward we need to go and get, and we can't because people are sitting in their, sitting in their lockers. I mean, mm. I so I'm I'm just gonna play devil's advocate for a second. And to be clear, I don't want us to spend forty million pounds on um, on Tammy Abraham. But like, if I said to you, there's a 23 year old striker who, I mean, granted, he's he's turning 24 in October. So you know, however you want to say that, he's 23 until he's 24. If I said to you, there's a 23 year old striker who has a 25-goal season and a 23-goal season in the championship at 18 and 20 years old, and has a 15-goal Premier League season, and is on less than 60000 a week, and is available to be purchased. And he's coming off a season where he's marginalized at a club, you know, where he didn't get the playing time, and they had bought a lot of stars ahead of him that blocked his, blocked his place. You know, if you look at that, and you say, okay, he's not even in his prime yet, He's, we could probably put him on 80 grand a week for a striker who has 50, a 15 Premier League goal season and big, big seasons in the championship. That's pretty interesting. I mean, you look at everybody wanted Buendia for what he did in the championship, and I love Buendia. I, I just think sometimes one of the best things you can do, actually, is target a post-hype player, right? Target a player who was really highly regarded, but for one reason or another, circumstances turned for him, maybe made the move too early, moved to the wrong place, and now you're getting him at a discount. The problem is, $40 million doesn't feel like a discount. $40 million feels like what that player 
probably should cost. But you look at English players in the Premier League and us being willing to pay, you know, fifty-five million for Ben White, who's got one Premier League season under his belt at defense you know, at central defense. What is a twenty-four-year-old English striker with a fifteen-goal season and a twenty-five-goal championship season worth? We're going to have to fulfill the striker situation. Can we do it with Balogun? Maybe. That's still hypo- uh, hypothetical. Martinelli, again, hypothetical. So we don't have any kind of proven right age striker behind Aubameyang in the club. We can either go push the boat way out for someone expensive, you know, go for a star. I don't know what star striker we get, frankly. Or we can go for a project, a younger guy. Well, you're going to be hard-pressed to find an affordable Premier League proven younger guy who's got goals in him. I don't, I just, Tammy Abraham is really interesting. He checks a lot of boxes. What? The solution is difficult. Yeah, how do you solve the striker position unless you go 60 mil? I mean, you know, because the way we solved it last time is we bought two of them. (laughs) 50 and 60 million. (laughs) This this is a, I've been thinking about this a lot and I haven't got got the answers, right? And I did like the sound of that Andre Silva, actually. I, I like the sound of him. He was 26, and he's got a specific skill around the box. And I thought, yeah, I like the sound of you because, you know, hopefully we're going to push up a bit more and have a bit more pressure in the other half. And I want someone better around the box who's not afraid to be in the box, you know. And so I thought, that sounds good. Tammy Abraham does a little bit of that. Um, Balogun, you know, are they too close in age? Does one block the other? I'm not so sure. Maybe not. It's a really complex one. You know, this is why I'm watching Balogun the most in preseason because I'm looking for answers. You know, I'm looking for answers and to see where he fits in the hierarchy, see how useful he is. Because once we see him, I think it'd be clear what the next move should look like. You know, do we go for a winger forward? You know, or someone from the left, maybe a goal scorer from the left. You know, like a Hazard type from the left who scores 15 goals, and just say we rotate around. You know, move Martin inside, move Balogun inside. There are options. I'm just not sure what it is. So Balogun holds the key. Lacazette Sell holds the key. Bamiyang Sell in a year's time. What do we do then? So yeah, this is a real complex one, mate, and I'm I'm struggling with it, if I'm honest with you. Mm. Fair enough. Uh, Tim, we don't have to spend much more time on this, but the striker position, I've said, is the most important in football. I mean, maybe that's just wrong, but it, it certainly feels like it for a t- team that needs goals. We have a top and tail situation with older players who we'd probably be happy to move on from and younger players Mm. in Balogun and Martinelli who are purely theoretical at the position, you know, sort of notionally could fill it at some point in time. It's not an easy situation to solve if you want to sort of have a path for those young guys, but have someone who can come in and play at the Premier League level and, and it works right away. So... If it's not Tammy Abraham, I don't know who it is, but how do you feel about that link yeah. specifically? N- not necessarily at that price, because I think we'd probably all agree at that price, you're sort of paying full fare. You're not getting the discount you'd want to get to take to take that shot, but how do you feel about the link in general? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this idea. I like the player, um, and I think regardless of, you know, the striker position looks crowded at the moment. It's not going to be crowded in a year or two, um, and we might as well get ahead of that. Um, But one of the reasons I like it, I mean, first of all, it might even encourage someone like Lacazette to go and look for a move if we wanted to be a bit harsh about that and say, look, we've just bought someone else. You're going to be third choice here. Um, So you can either go now or you can have your Bosman next year when you haven't played, when you've barely played for a year. Um, So maybe it might neatly kind of bring that situation to a head a little bit. But the reason I like it, I, I like the player's age. And because he doesn't have to come in and because, again, I like the player. The the question we've really got to ask ourselves is, can he or will he go to that next level as a player? And, you know, look at the lineage of Arsenal strikers, right? Henri, Van Persie, Aubameyang. Um, You know, is is he that vintage or is he stuck in the like he's probably broadly in the Giroud category um, at the moment? Obviously, very different player. But, you know, that kind of level of player. But like as you say, Elliot, I think there's definitely some evidence that he can go to another level. And the good thing is, with Aubameyang with two years left on his contract, we get a couple of years to find that out, essentially. And so if we do it now, we have Abraham for two years, 
you know, we have him with us and we can have a look at whether he goes to that next level. And then when Aubameyang goes, we go, yep, that's fine. He's replaced. We did that two years ago. Brilliant. We can do something else. If not, then I guess a little bit like Manchester City with like Gabriel Jesus. I think they've probably come to the decision that he's not going to be Aguero's replacement. They'll get paid for Gabriel Jesus because he's still young. So if in two to three years, like it comes, you know, we've got a 25, 26 year old Abraham who I don't think will completely bomb, even if he does like a Lacazette for a couple of seasons and it's not quite enough for us, then we can, we can move him on. Um, you know, maybe not at profit per se, because as you say, the price does seem quite high, but we'll have, we'd have no trouble moving on a 25, 26 year old Abraham if we needed to, I don't think in a couple of years. So I, I do actually quite like the look of that deal. And, and to your point, Elliot, you know, th- this is the kind of age of striker we're really looking at, isn't it? Like, because we've got some unproven teenagers and we've got some guys at the at the kind of end of their career so that like that middle tier striker that's exactly what we're looking for and if abraham had this let's say abraham had done this in like the bundesliga or syria or spain or something where he'd you know he had a really solid season scored loads of goals and then you know his team bought loads of attackers that they didn't think about how they could accommodate and they had to play them because they're very expensive and you know he didn't get much of a look in like you you'd Broadly, you'd like that deal, wouldn't you? You'd go, again, dependent on price. You'd go, okay, yeah, like you say, post-hype player, we can still do something with this player. So um, I, I get the kind of fatigue over buying players from Chelsea, but that doesn't mean that every single player you buy from Chelsea is going to be Willian um, or even Louise or Czech. Like, that they were on diff- very different career trajectories. So uh, I, I'd be I'd be a fan of this move. Again, so long as maybe if, if that precluded us from doing good midfield business i would prioritize that um but i i i I like the sound of this i have to say yeah i mean if you say to me english striker with premier league experience turning 24 who could be on a reasonable wage and has seasons under his belt where he's scored the kind of goals you'd hope to see in a vacuum i would say (laughs) i would say calvert lewin well i mean calvert can you get it i mean so this is the funny thing right clive I would kill for a Calvert-Lewin. Kill for him. You can't get him. And what would he cost? Would Calvert-Lewin be $65 million and you put him on 140 a week? Like, what, what would Calvert-Lewin take to get? No, no, they're similar age. They're similar age. And so, similar sort, you know, similar sort of outputs. I just think he's stronger. But it's just a preference thing. I think he's so. better. I, I agree he's better. You know, I, I mean, just the eye test wise. Now, apparently he's already on 72,000 pounds a week, you know, so he's he's already on a considerably a bit Come more. On, this, is, this is Arsenal, right? Yeah, Personal you can, yeah. terms. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, you, you can do that. Those two people um, doesn't make a difference. I think it's just a preference thing. I think he offers, he offers a skill set which is quite unique. And what he does, you know, around the box is, you know, and down the channels, in the air is really good, and I take I take both your points about Tammy Abraham. You know, he's he's a nice idea. You can't deny it. It's a nice idea. I just don't like Chelsea. Sorry no, I, I I hear you. The, the funny thing about Calvert Lewin, who is a bit older, he's a bit older than Abraham. His best ever season, sixteen goals for Everton last season. You know, so I mean, it. I don't know. It, it all feels. It feels like we do get like a, a a hot player of the moment, but going for Calvert Lewin right now, where he's the hot player of the moment. Versus going for Abraham, where maybe the hype died down a bit because he lost his spot last season. You'd like to think that there would be an efficiency in the market there. It doesn't seem to be there. Um, let's continue on with the game, though. And if, if you remember that we were actually talking about that, which you may not at this point, we can start to wrap up, too. But um, the second half of the game, I think, looked a little more like Arsenal playing preseason football. And the players who impressed, Lacazette, Pepe, Smith Rowe. Let's start with Smith Rowe. Uh, some social media pictures suggest he might be getting the number 10. Some people love that. Some people hate that because, because of who's had the number 10. Um, I think it would be great for him. And I think there's more big things to come. Love seeing him get a goal in our first preseason game. I mean, the question is, can he step up now with the end product? I think it's in there. And him arriving in the box, you know, nice, confident finish. It, it's a good sign. In terms of players that really unlock the possibility for us this season, Smithrow playing a lot of games, staying fit and contributing, making a leap up, he strikes me as one of the most important. So 
impressed by the little bit you saw from him. He looks like he's he he could start the season tomorrow to me. Clive, sorry. Oh, sorry, mate. Yeah, I, I saw a little bit of the game, just about you know, about 15, 20 minutes of the game. And I did notice he looked fitter. You know, I did notice that. I thought, you see some pictures of him and the definition, muscle definition in his legs. I thought, yeah, mate, you've been doing stuff, which is good, you know, which is really good. He looks like a, <laughs> he's turning into a, Turning into a man, and that can happen really, really quickly. <laughs> Eventually, it'll happen to me. <laughs> so, like, uh, it can happen really, really quickly. I think, yeah, I'm, I, we're all hopeful for him. Um, how do I feel about him with the ten shirt? Yeah, I'm not so sure actually, because I'm hoping for a signing to come in to take that. So, again, a little bit of bias there. But if he sees himself as a ten for Arsenal Football Club, and Arsenal see him as that valuable, I'm all for that because I do think there's there's something about this boy that I think very very special actually and his intelligence around the game and the football and what to do in space and then how to travel through it and around people finishes decisions is way beyond his years you know way beyond his years he's gonna he's gonna improve physically he's gonna improve speed wise i think there's something there you know there really is something there and um as long as we look after his health. So uh, I do think Arsenal are projecting with him and maybe in six months' time that number 10 is going to fit right on his shoulders and we won't even be thinking about it, you know. So, um, yeah, good luck to him. He's pushing the club to get his contract and that's exactly what he should do and uh, I can't wait till he signs it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm i really excited for the season ahead for him and, uh, you know, assuming he can stay fit, I think it changes our outlook a lot. Tim, the... The player that sort of stood out a little bit in that second half, other than Smith, Rowe, and Pepe, I mean, Lacazette was just bodying some of these guys, just blowing past them, Mm -hmm. pushing them over, had a real hunger about the way he was playing. There is this perception like, we just got to get out from under Lacazette here. We need to move him on. We need to get away from him. There's a small part of me that thinks at this stage, we'd be much better off getting out from under Aubameyang's contract, even if that meant a season of Laka being our number one striker. I don't think that you know, lights anybody's hair on fire, but I know which one is starting to look more like the distressed asset to me. And it's the, you know, 32 year old on 300,000 a week in terms of Lacazette looking fired up as energetic as ever is ready to go. I think the presumption has been that he will go, but you know, there's no strong links. There's no really significant concrete sort of rumors or links around him. What do you think if you look in your crystal ball, the future holds for Lacazette at Arsenal? I mean, we could just let him play out his contract, and given that he, you know, he did sort of finish last season as our best striker, and we're not really sure where Aubameyang's at right now. Is could you make an argument, given what we just discussed? You know, our striker situation not really being very clear cut between the experience and the inexperience. That just letting him play out his contract, so we have someone we trust behind Aubameyang, makes some sense. Yeah, I, I do think that is what will happen. Um, ultimately, I, I think the thing uh, you could absolutely make a case for, you know, trying to get rid of Aubameyang and, and keeping Lacazette for a year, and, and then Abraham coming in, um, you know, with that look looks looks quite good, quite smart. I, I think the issue really is not so much the 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 difference in quality between Aubameyang and Lacazette; it's the difference in style. They do completely different things. It, and, and so, like Arsenal still have, as they have always had with both of them, like a need to really, like they've never really tried to build around either of them. They've tried to accommodate both of them, and 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 there just isn't a good way of doing it. Because if if you do, you know, um, throw your weight behind Lacazette, what you do then, and then you say, well, he only really gets like 15 goals a season from open play, so is that enough? But then what you do, if you're going to do that, is you throw your weight behind Pepe as um, as like your main goal scorer, I think, or at least your joint main goal scorer, and you move to, you know, you move more to that Liverpool model of like, yeah, Lacazette will contribute, but really it's going to be Pepe doing that Mohamed Salah thing. Um, and, you know, there will be mixed views on whether he's good enough to do that. I, I kind of think he is, I have to say, because I just think he's so good in front of goal and he's so good at getting shots off. And, and you know, even if everything else in his game is very frustrating, if you just make your decision that that's what you want Pepe to do, again, much like Salah, like Salah doesn't do anything else for Liverpool. He's not involved in build-up. He doesn't get back and protect the fullback. He's just there to 
get the ball, get it on his left foot and hit shots. And I, I do think Pepe can do that. So you can configure your attack that way if you want to, or you can you can go the Aubameyang way. That, that, that to me is the problem. It's not the gap in... There is a gap in quality between Lacazette and Aubameyang, I think, but it's just the complete gap in style and the completely different things you have to do to kind of Tim, play towards what, their strengths. What do you think... This is why I get perplexed, right? What type of centre forward do you think we want to have, or and yeah, what do we want to be? This, I, I don't know. Th- yeah, yeah, and and that is a good question. Like I, I don't really know what Arteta wants, but that's kind of what another reason I like the idea of Abraham because he kind of does both. I think he's like quite good in in the area at picking up positions and getting shots. I do think he does the link thing quite well. When Tuchel first came in, he was playing a- Abraham as like a false nine. Um, because he he wanted to get uh, Zayesh and um, and Pulisic like he he was trying to do that Liverpool thing right and he was trying to play him in more of a Firmino role and um and it actually like it worked quite well and Chelsea were doing things like they were overloading the right flank so they had Zayesh and they had Hudson Odoi playing as a right wing back and they had like Abraham like um, doing that Firmino slash Harry Kane thing of dropping short and feeding them the ball and and I think he can do that. I think the issue was really that Chelsea moved away from that idea quite quickly um, and, and because they realised that that was a style that basically excluded Havertz and Werner um, and they kind of decided not to do that. But like that, that's kind of why I like Abraham. Like I think he's kind of got both profiles, um, if that makes sense, whereas we've got two guys who have got a very specific profile and they're both miles away from one another. Mm. I, guys, I got to be honest. I, I know I'm supposed to have a strong feeling. I don't have any idea. Like I, I'm literally at sea. You know what? I, I the, the striker situation for me is the hardest one because I have big hope for Martinelli and maybe Balogun, but I realize they cannot be the guys right now. I am pretty nervous about what we're going to get from Aubameyang now. And while I have always felt that Lacazette was not quite good enough, we probably shouldn't have bought him. We should have just bought Oba when we bought him. And, you know, that's water under the bridge. You know, Lacazette's a bit younger and his most recent performances have suggested maybe he's playing a bit better, but I still don't think he's as good as we need. And yet I don't look around the market and say, here's a striker. We can just go get who's awesome. Let's do it. Um, you know, I see what Lester have tried to do with the position with, what was it, Patson Daka? Is that his name? And, yeah. and you know, Inacho a few seasons ago, and I look at Otis and Edward, but like, you know, then there's a Tammy Abraham. You could be spending $40 million on. The market is just very weird at that position. I don't know. There is, there is, there is yep. one other option, Elliot, just one other option. You could just keep Lacazette on for another year. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Just, just let him play him out a, his contract and kick the can down give, the him a, give him a one-year extension. It's, you know, maybe trigger an option if there is one. There might be one there. Why not and, let him just play it out, though, if you don't think there's going to be a market well, for him, really? If you, can, if you can keep on the same money, for another year, and then there's some, you know, there might be 10 mil for you next year. What it does allow, and he's selling Ketia, what it does allow is Balogun to take that third striker role. And mm-hmm. and we we go status quo while we're waiting mm-hmm. for the option. So the more I listen to Tim speak, the more he's convinced me about Tammy Abraham and for a profile perspective. But I'm just not sure we're going to fix it this summer, you know, because the wages we've put on those two guys is just so heavy. And there's just no money out there to sort of pay them, you know. So um, Atletico Madrid's stories have gone quiet, you know, for for Lacazette. So I, I think we could be in a status quo there, maybe losing Ketia. And then um, that's where we are. That's what I think is going to end up happening, but maybe wrong. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I don't know. I mean, well, let, let me just ask you this, Clive. I, none of us care about preseason in term or early preseason anyway, in terms of results. Do you have any nervousness looking at that game and, and you know, the, the situation nah. it was? I mean, there were a lot of kids out there. And, you know, I, I don't think we need to dive in it right now, you know, the, the really young players, because there were some really young players out there who got to make their first, you know, senior appearance for Arsenal. And I, I think that's great. I don't think any of them are going to feature this season. I don't think any of the, the young guys that we saw against Hibs will play for Arsenal this season. So I don't think we really need to get into it. Um but one of the interesting things that came out of it was a, a post-match comment uh, from Arteta when asked about transfers. He said, we've got one for now, and we're really happy with the one we have. We will work with the players we have, try to make them better and compete as well as we can. Now, 
what else is he going to say is what people are going to say. What does that matter? Who cares? It's, you know, it's, it's, he's not going to say, oh, we've got all the players in. But like he could say, we know the work that needs to be done and we're very busy. He could say there are a lot of things in motion, but at this time I'm not prepared to, to discuss them. He could say, we feel confident that we have a plan for the summer that will leave us in great shape for the season. He didn't say that. He said, we have one and we're happy with the one. We're going to fight with the players we have. <laughs> I, look, I'm not saying we're just going to get Tavares and no one else. I think Lakanga is going to be announced any minute. But in terms of the players that move the needle and change the first team, like it's starting to get late. I mean, it is mid-July. We are in the preseason. The season starts, what, August 8th, 9th, uh, tw- 12th, 11th, so, something like that. So we, it's a weekend before, th- that's it, the weekend before Football Fest, so I should know that. Um, yeah, the 13th. And like, actually, we start on a Friday, right? We we play on the Friday that opens the season against Brentford, yep, I think. Friday so, the 13th. Friday the 13th, perfect. What could go wrong? Um, so, I mean, co- the fact that that comment is maybe not as emphatic as we'd like, combined with the number of outgoings and incomings we've expected that have not happened yet, are you prepared to say all of this, it's still early, don't worry talk, is now maybe getting a little stale. Can I can I go into whiskers mode yet, or is it still too early for me to worry? No, I, uh, like the whiskers that I am. Well, let's be honest, right? I've never never managed to stop you worrying, so I'm not going to stop you worrying now. You right? So, um, but I'm, I'm I'm holding it together, Clive. I, I'm, I think you know. <laughs> I think I'm not sure the window shuts, but it doesn't it doesn't shut on August the 13th. That's for sure. And I think it frustrates us fans because we think, why can't you do this stuff early? It's just brinkmanship. And keep what's happening in Europe, what's happening in France in particular. Why would you pay money now? Wait till they're literally got no bread or milk in the, in the fridge. Do you know what I mean? Wait and see what happens. Um, I think it's just going to be one of those late, it's going to be one of those late rushes, I'm afraid, because everyone's got players to move. Everyone's got players to, they want to loan if they can't sell them. There's too many players in the wrong places. And it's got to happen because last year no one moved as much as they could have done. So I think it's going to be a huge amount of movement, but it's going to be a huge amount of catalog moves. You know, buy now, pay later. You know, so it's going to be like that. It really is. And and people are stacking up debt for when fans can come back in. Those revenues are there. I see you know, COVID's not gone away, you know, and it's still going to, I think there's still going to be restrictions in the winter. Well, I really do think that. And so... There's still there's more guaranteed revenues, but not enough guaranteed revenues. I listened to a podcast the other day about the TV deal in France. It's not great. The TV deal in Italy from the zone that, that looks quite promising. Our TV deal is steady and set, you know, but it's there's still revenue issues, and so it's, we just got to wait. I'm afraid, and the hope was we'd have ten out, seven in, jumping on the plane to Florida. That'd be nice. Everyone settled in. I'm afraid it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. It's a tough market, and I I understand it's a tough market. I think all of the things that we need to align for us this season, for the season to go well, and for us to take advantage of, you know, just having the Premier League to focus on. Guys, like when you look at who we play to start the season, you know, the the window closes after Manchester City at the Etihad. You know, it's 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 a tough start. It's Brentford, but then Chelsea and City. Oh, by the way, I remember another time when we left our business late in the summer and played in Manchester late in August. <laughs> Anybody, any remember that? Tim, you might have been there. <laughs> you remember the score? Late late August uh, no. game. Late late August game in Manchester that led to a, no. a transfer no. window. Just erased from my memory. No, no. It doesn't doesn't, doesn't did, you go to, did you go to did you go to that week as well, Tim? I game. did. Yes. Oh, because that was a humdinger of a game, wasn't it? It was really hot and. And One stressful. of the best European aways I've ever done. There yeah. you go. Yeah, there, there was go. a there was a hell of a Theo Walcott goal in that game, wasn't there? Um, or was that the home game? That was, uh, he scored in both games, yep. but Chesney yep. made um, one the of penalty the best save. penalty saves yep. you'll ever see. Yep. Yeah. Um, but well, anyway, so more, more talk of that. Let's talk of the Manchester game. My point is, Tim, the, the people that want to be given the green light to, to be frustrated and panic, are you not prepared to give them the green light yet? I mean, if people want to, they're quite welcome to. I'm not going to talk them well, out if of they, it. If they were um, asking for your permission, would, would you say, just <laughs> just hold a little bit. The Euro's just ended. Just hang on a bit. Yeah, yeah. I, basically, I would always set it against what what is the whole market doing at the moment. And if the market's really moving and we're not, 
I think that's quite different. I, I don't think it is. And as Clive says, there, there are clearly like irons in the fire, like Shaka, like Ben White. I think we'll hear about Lukonga any time now. Like there, there is stuff happening. Um, and, you know, just, I guess, when it's all announced and things like that. I, I do think that the Euro, like a tournament to always slow things down. They just do. Um, it's just as simple as that. Um, so I, I, I'm not, I'm not yet, but I completely understand like ideally it would all be done now. Um, and you know, you're looking at having everyone involved in preseason and things like that. I, I think honestly, like a lot of players that we might be interested in, were probably at the Euros anyway. So wouldn't be joining us for preseason just yet. Um, but you know, if, if I, I can understand with the volume of stuff we need to do, I, I guess personally, I was always prepared for this to be quite a difficult summer with quite a slow market. So I'm personally not there yet, but I do understand people saying we've got loads to do and the season starts in four weeks. Cause that's true as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the market will get moving. I, I have no doubt. And I, I think that there's some business we can pre feel pretty sure will get done. Um, as for whether all the business we're kind of expecting to get done, well, I, I don't know. I mean, we the one thing that I think is sort of changing is when you look at the names we were associated with and you look at, oh, we're bidding for Locatelli. You know, we were, we were in for Camavinga and we're spending $55 million on Ben White. And you sort of start to drill in. We've done Tavares. Lukonga's coming in. There's a... There's a Cooperman, Cooper Myers, someone from uh, the Eredivisie we're linked with. Coop Myers. Coop Myers, yeah, you Coop know, which Myers. is, you know, he's, again. Um, I know, he's a lefty, Shaka type. Mm -hmm. Very, um, very strong left foot. Played in defense, a little bit sharp in the challenge, but and lacking in speed. But, you know, inter a lot of Arsenal fans like him, a lot like him. Uh, the, the fit is, is nice, actually, but. Yeah, it's just sort of interesting, you know, right? Because we're we're all sort of trying to read the tea leaves about whether we're gonna we're gonna go big and spend a lot or or whether we're gonna try to budget it. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see. So let's um let's leave it there. I know Tim, you're just uh, you're just typing in the chat that the Saliba to Marseille thing is confirmed, but we we kind of done the discussion on Saliba. N nothing new there, though, right? We sort of knew that was happening. I assume. It, yeah, yeah, and all, all I'll say is just in. I'm just reading Arsenal's statement on it. There's there's quite a bit more detail with like some stuff from Edu on why they're doing it and things like that. So it's not just he's gone on loan subject to the completion of regulatory processes. There, there's like quite a bit of bump there from Edu. All right, well that's cool. I I think we're going to do a, a Patreon pod tomorrow with Paul. So maybe what Paul and I will do is um, dive into the Saliba discussion because the good thing about it is it will never ever end. And it will always be a fertile ground for people to be mad at each other. So that's the kind of content we like to cover. Let, let's leave it there. Hopefully Arsenal will give us uh, a little bit more to, to dive into over the next few days. There's a game over the weekend, so we'll cover that with Instant Reaction Pod and then again on Monday. Um, and as preseason starts to heat, heat up and players start to come back, get a little bit better sense of where we are and maybe a bit better sense of what the squad's going to look like. So uh, Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. Tim's on Twitter at Stoberto. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Say it every pod, but don't say it enough. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely love that you're here. Love that you're part of this community that we are building together to try to get through these interesting times with Arsenal and the very bizarre last year we've had and, and the ups and the downs. And it just means the world to us that you're that you're here, that you listen, that you comment and, and get involved. So thank you for that. And we'll uh, hopefully have more fun new shows lined up for the this year, including regular uh, live streams and take advantage of the no midweek football to do some, some extra fun stuff. We're going to have some limited series um, uh, episodes as well too so a lot to come and and hopefully stuff you'll actually enjoy because <laughs> that, that would be better than not so it's rangers at the weekend we'll go with our normal outro here and say we love you we'll talk to you after arsenal 10 rangers news no.